Hey, Raymond Guzman, how are you? I'm doing great, Robert Foster. How are you today? Good, good. Uh, we're so glad you agreed to do this. Uh, we have your uh, in-person opening tomorrow here at the museum, but we wanted to sort of whet people's appetite. They may not be able to make it mm -hmm. or might not be able to engage you as much as we're able to do now. And uh, we're up here in the upper gallery here at 1301 Hudson Street and we'd like to learn more about you as an artist. I think the work looks great up here. I do encourage people to come here, but uh, just start, I'm just gonna throw out a, a, you know, a, a general question. How did you get involved in the arts and influences, your background, that sort of thing? Well, the first thing I wanna say is uh, thank you for having me here. Sure. The museum's done a great job through the years and I'm very proud and happy to be a part of this. Uh, I will say that uh, for me, uh, painting has always been a part of my life, but never as thinking of it as being an artist. It was something I did as a child. I had my first oil paint box when I was about eight years old, and I used to paint fantasy pictures and also clipper ships, uh, things that I saw in the history book, and I just loved the feeling of painting on, on canvas board. Uh, it had grown from there, uh, through the years in my household, as I said uh, to other people, uh, there was no such thing as artists. Um, we didn't know about fine artists. We didn't know about uh, an aspiration to be a painter, but we did have in our household posters. And one of them was of Picasso, Picasso's work, the musicians. The other one was Jesus Christ with the flaming heart because we were Catholics. Uh, and the uh, other picture that we had there was um, uh, stuff from uh, Rockwell. And uh, so growing up with that and uh, J.F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, no, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, because he stood for the future. Uh, and so those were the images that I had that I grew up with. Um, this was uh, in the South Bronx where I grew up up until I was 11 years old and we had moved to Jersey City. And when we moved to Jersey City in the Heights, it was like the country for me. It was a wonderful experience. Um, and I even got a paper route and delivered papers. And I went to uh, uh, grammar school up there. And I say up there because we're up, we're down below in the valley, Hoboken Valley. And the Heights are the Heights. They're up the Palisade Heights. And uh, I went to Dickinson High School up there. We had a great, art teacher, Claire Wolikowski, and she was fantastic. Uh, we were allowed to take art classes all four years while we were there. And I remember asking Claire, because uh, I spoke to her a couple of years ago, uh, and I said, you know, we had a great experience with you up there. We had even African-American art, and people were saying, what are you studying African-American art? We said, Claire opening up the world for us. And so it was a great experience working with her. And she said that she had to admit that those four years, the group of kids, there must've been about 20 of us who traveled all four years with her. Uh, she says, we were an exceptional group. <laughs> and I said, Claire, really? She goes, no, it was before that. She said, we, I didn't have any, there were a lot of talent there, but it wasn't uh, uh, concentrated like it was with us. And she said, and afterwards, it was over. Hmm. So Timing um, is everything. Timing is everything. Claire was instrumental in pre helping us prepare portfolios. Um, she says, one day when you're off to college, they're going to look for work. And she was uh, a wonderful experience um, in order to make us aware of that. Um, I had also, while going to Dickinson High School, at, uh, at night, my uncle, who was my mentor, Frank Rod, uh, he was the artist in the family and he was working on Madison Avenue as a commercial artist. And he had sent me, I was fortunate again, he asked would I be interested in going to night school, painting, painting class, an adult painting class at the School of Visual Arts. I said, absolutely. So for three years, I would go to high school during the day and they take adult painting classes at night at SVA. So this is 1970s or? This was um, 
let's see, high school, I graduated high school in 73. So it was quite early. Right. right? I would take the, the, the bus to Port Authority from Jersey City and then take the train from Port Authority to 23rd Street uh, and 3rd Avenue and take classes at SVA. And it was a, a great experience. But you were really dedicated because that, I mean, you had other homework, you had other classes. I had other but... interests and, you know, I, I was on the uh, cross country team that took place during the day, fencing during the day. But at night, I couldn't wait for a painting class. I knew that it was. And that's uh, a big high school. 3,000 students at the time. There was over 3,000 students and it's on the hill. Um, you can look that up. And it's on, on, we call it the hill, but it's the, towards the end of the Palisades. The Palisades seems to start here in Hudson County and then travels all the way up, pardon my table here. It's okay. Travels all the way up north through Harriman State Park, Bear Mountain, uh, the Adirondacks into Canada. Sure. So when you see the, the, the topography of this, uh, Hudson County, um, for me, I see prehistory, a prehistoric environment. Uh, even though it's all occupied with our city, right, our lives, our people, uh, and all great businesses and experiences, but you can see underneath all of this that there's... there's and, a, and if anyone doesn't know where the high school is, uh, if you're on the Turnpike Extension and you're driving, shall we say, uh, uh, east to New York, you just can't miss it. You it's the largest it. building. The largest it it building. looks like, I don't know, a very classical architecture. It looks like the Pantheon or something. Very beautiful. Actually, it was modeled after Buckingham Palace. Okay, okay. <laughs> something notable. I know that. I saw, I know that for sure. Right, right. And um, so what was Hudson County like in the late, you know, in the 1970s? In the 70s. Uh, Hudson County for me was a great experience, a great place to grow up. Um, we had a city um, and we had living in the Heights, we had down below and that hill was our hangout. It was our playground. It was, it was a natural forest then. And uh, being able to see Hoboken from, or, or for us at Hoboken wasn't as prominent as it is now in our lives, but at that time, it was another city down below. And here we are up above. And in those days, what is where the light rail is now, used to be freight trains. And freight trains would travel through there and they'd stop and they'd stay there for three or four days. So if you were going like we would to art school in those days, you take the train down to the palace, through the Palisade down Patterson Plank Road and get across, try to get across the railroad tracks, but if the train was there, you have to go right back into Journal Square and take the train in the other way. So it was a very different experience. Uh, growing up in Hudson County, uh, I met a lot of interesting people um, going through school here uh, also. And uh, it was a uh, uh, little nooks and crannies. We, we found a, a great bookshop. My friend and I uh, would go for walks for hours and we'd carry our 35 millimeter cameras and we take pictures of everything and anything and stop at the bookstore and come home with shopping bags full of books. Uh, so those are just a little going on. When I think about it, you're probably one of the few artists, you know, working today in Hoboken, Hudson County, that, uh, you know, had their formative years here. You know, we have the idea that most of the artists are more recent transplant, but you, you've definitely have your Hudson County credits. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm proud of it, especially now at this point in my life. I look back, you know, when you're in it, you're just part of the, the growing cycle, you know, part of the life, uh, being in a band, uh, bike riding. Uh, it was all part of, uh, and, and meeting all these people and all these different uh, experiences. I remember once uh, my friend Nick, Lee Pfeiffer and I, uh, and uh, Kevin Lynch, we were invited down to the Holland Hotel in Journal Square. Wow. And it was a fun experience because it was Mayor Whalen's campaign. Okay. And the place was packed. And 
we at that time we thought it was strange. It was only men. Only men were in there. We're saying, where, where the, where are the women? Where are the mothers? Where are the girls? There was nobody here. Just men, and some of them were wearing straw caps. They had uh, even a, the the watch and the fob. It was really old time, hunting. hunting. So that would have been the mayor, mayor for Jersey, Jersey City. City. Yes, Mayor Whaley. Right. So, and I've right. seen a lot of mayors. I've been, you know, being in Hudson County. Uh, it's it's big and it's also small. It's neighborhood enough that. Anybody who's been here like yourself and all the other artists who are here now, sure. they know all the mayors. Right. They know their families. Sure. It's a small town. It's a small town. Um, so you go to these night classes at School of Visual Arts at the same time you're going to high school. What happens after high school? After high school, um, I applied to uh, several art schools, um, Philadelphia College of Art, Cooper Union, and School of Visual Arts. And I handed in all my portfolio was great to have all of this great portfolio work. And I had interviews at all of them. So I got into SVA and also into Philadelphia College of Art. Uh, Cooper Union, I wasn't their, their stock of trade. It wasn't my style. I wasn't their style. Uh, but I ended up at School of Visual Arts. Uh, and I love that school. And to this very day, I still try and participate a little bit. Uh, and uh, also give to the SVA uh, fund because I, I also was very fortunate. I got a four-year scholarship because of that portfolio. That's great. Yeah, it was really a, a great. Do you remember school. anyone else from your class getting that type of? Yes, uh, a boost? friend of mine, Vicky, uh, and uh, she now lives in Florida. She was a brilliant artist too, and she, I ended up in the fine art department, and she ended up in the graphic design department. And she's a brilliant thinker commercial art thinker she was she came up with great campaigns right. and you can understand why she got what she and that school's known for uh you know highly credentialed teachers who are working in the field so the you field. probably met some interesting people and i met some very interesting people um a lot of my teachers there were well known artists i had jennifer bartlett who was a great abstract artist uh and she was a, a very unique person in that I wanted, when I was at SVA, I saw the School of Visual Arts as a school. It's a place for me to learn and suck in as much as possible as I could from every department. So I remember my uh, realist representational painting class with Don Nice and uh, John Button, uh, another set of great artists who were upset that I was taking Jennifer Bartlett's class, which was abstract. Jennifer was upset. She said, I don't want people in the representation world thinking that they can just smear paint on a canvas and get a get a get a degree, get 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 their diploma. So I was frustrated, but again, I wanted to learn. I wanted to know what she had to say, and I loved her work to this very day. I think she's a brilliant thinker. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to to have Joseph Kasuth, who was a conceptualist artist. And I bring some of my process and thinking to some of the conceptual. Uh, so there are paintings that I do that I keep for myself that help me evolve from this because I'm thinking of all those different processes. So SVA in that respect, they didn't like what I was doing, but I did take everything. And uh, but was, in the end, you sort of have gone more realist. Uh, it's in the end, I, I went representational. to representational work. Um, I was doing some uh, realism. I didn't want to do super realism. That was, for me, it, was, it felt fatty. It felt, um, and I uh, worked with John Casiri, who was a great uh, realist. <clears throat> uh, and uh, we had Chuck Close come to, through SVA, uh, Neil Welliver. These are all people who are, you know, in, in, in the operational in the fine art world. <clears throat> and uh, it was, I, I, I continued my work. Uh, as a representational person, but I knew that I had to find my path. Sure. That's what school is about, right? That's what it is. Yeah. That's right. Uh, it's interesting how, you know, different departments really are kind of rigid and want you to stay within the realm of, shall we say, abstraction right. or conceptual. I think things have opened up a little more, hopefully, but it sounds like you were able to cherry pick what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was very fortunate. I also insisted. Mm -hmm. insisted on it and insisted on it and uh, 
And that's what school's about. Right. But sometimes as a young student, it's hard to know. You're sort of, yeah. you know, sort of not seduced, but, you know, drawn by to a certain teacher through reputation and then you yes. imitate them yes, and absolutely. so on. So it does take a an individual and to you sort as a of teacher see that. and a photographer, you know that. Oh, you definitely. You know exactly. Yeah, we've all gone through it. That's right. Whatever. That's right. Um, and uh, so what happens after School of Visual Arts? After School of Visual Arts, I uh, decided that I want to find my path in the in the art world uh and so i continued to um do my paintings uh we were living in jersey city and one day we we're coming down the stairs and i met my friend julio fernandez who today everybody knows him as uh, that lead guitarist for spiral gyra so he was downstairs going to music school and we were coming out the door we were going to art school and he says, why don't you guys come and see me play tonight at Signore's Lounge in Hoboken? Signore's Lounge. Signori's I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, cool, let's do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we end up coming here, <clears throat> take the bus, get off in front of ShopRite, down on First Street, Newark Street. And we're a little lost. We're not sure where we're going. And there's this young man there. He goes, you guys uh, need help? And we were a little leery and we said, uh, yeah, we're looking for Signori's Lounge. He goes, oh, you came to hear Julio play. And we said, yeah. He says, follow me. It's my club. I'm Frank Rea. So Frank Rea <clears throat> became our friend in those days. And uh, to this very day, I'm proud to say he's still a, a, a good friend, a good person. Uh, for all the experiences we've all had <clears throat> in our lives. <clears throat> And uh, we go to the club, and on the way to the club, he says, you guys got to come here. Hoboken's where it's happening. Music scene, the food scene. Uh, so what year is this, maybe? This is uh, 1979. Wow. So after we were with Julio, we, was, we checked out the towns and all the different things that were going on here. The art scene was great. Writers were here, um, writers' workshops. Photographers, I mean, it was packed, and everybody from art school was here. So the following month, we moved. And the rent was cheap. The rent was cheap. Everybody's complained, but the rent was cheap for us. And uh, here we were. Right. And so we, I started a, a business in Hoboken um, because I didn't want to wait tables uh, like I did previously in my, in my early years at college. I started a business called Murals and Other Art Forms. So we would paint murals and do decorative work. And we started in Hoboken, some of the homes, wood graining hallways, uh, marbling some walls and stuff. And it was interesting because that's what William de Kooning did when he came to Hoboken. Uh, I think it was the late 40s. He, he did the same thing. Wallpaper. Wallpaper. <laughs> the crafts, the, the craft people. Yeah. So uh, we did that. And then... We started working in the apparently real estate market was doing very good in Manhattan. So we were brought into Manhattan and we started doing we did the Chrysler building, the top floor there uh, for an architectural firm. And uh, it came from another project we had done at the New York Bar Association, the bar building. So we painted fresco work. We painted we did mosaics, true mosaics. We did gold leaf. So we did I ran my business like a craft building craft renaissance studio so it was great because we had all these artists from art school that were all well trained right and so you're not you know doing your personal fine artwork but you're still using your fine art skills absolutely and uh it's sort of at night you do your personal painting at night time, and that's not going to pay the bills and because i i had a, a a good good paying project job um i had a nice studio right it's on first and adams and uh we did that for for a number of years until the market crashed and so we were caught in between one project and another and we knew financially well this is this is going to be bad if i don't think of something quick so that's how the sign shop the sign business was born hoboken sign that was 1986 and uh i had the studio i had the trucks we had the scaffolding we had the paint the only thing is i wasn't a trained sign painter so I had to learn the trade. Uh, I know how to letter with a brush and a mall stick now. 
And, and I have to say that Hoboken hadn't had a sign shop for 14 years. There was a void there because LT Devlin on 14th Street had retired. Devlin, I've seen that name. You've we have it? a few signs in our collection. Oh, really? Devlin. Yeah. yeah, LT. Yeah. Yeah. So LT went to Florida, retired, so that Hoboken had a void. So you've connected with some people from the previous generation. Uh, so did you connect with Devlin, or where, how did you learn no, the no, sign? I, I learned from other people that LT Devlin, you have to go to 14th Street. His store is still there. It was a, a shotgun uh, shop for the long panels that were in there. And uh, I was very fortunate in that I was a terrible sign painter, but Hoboken did didn't know the difference because there was nobody here for 14 years. So I stumbled along and then I started to embrace the craft and I started to create signs that were not just signs, they were works of art. Uh, works of art that, because I also had a graphic design background from my uncle working on Madison Avenue that I knew was advertising, but I also knew that it was a craft and it was my opportunity to marry these two and create unique and beautiful signs. So I started following other great sign makers in the country uh, and I found Sign of the Times magazine and there were people on the cover like Mark Otis and Noel Weber and these are names I'm mentioning that people should look up who were brilliant sign makers and they were not trained as sign painters. These were craft people. So I said, that's that's the path. That's what I'm going to do. And so I worked it long enough and hard enough that we started making. And, and then the nice thing in Hoboken, we had clients that were open. They said, yes, let's do something like that. Right. And uh, we had won the sign contest, the Sign of the Time sign contest in 1993. And uh, we had become prominent sign people. It was a great experience. And, yeah. and to this day, I have all these wonderful friends in the sign business. Uh, and we belong to a group called Letterheads. And it's grown from seven guys in Colorado back in the late 70s. It's now global. Wow. It's all over the world. And there's no president. There's no dues. Uh, just show up. Bring your best. You learn with the best and pass that along to other people who are open to that. Sure. Um, another old timer I think you worked with uh, is Frank Mazio. Frank Can you Mazzio. tell us a little bit about him? Frank Mazio uh, was uh, a great artist in Hoboken. And I met him because he had a shop on Washington Street uh, and he had his paintings in the windows and he was also the frame shop. And I went in one day to talk with him. Uh, sure enough, he started his sign business as a window dresser. He had a shop on 2nd Street, 2nd, which is now McDonald's. That was his studio. And he would go and do all the windows, not only on Washington Street for the key businesses here, but he worked for Saks Fifth Avenue, B. Altman, um, Lord and Taylor, and in those days, it was very important. The window display business was tremendous. You had to be craft oriented. You had to be letterers. You had to know fabrics. You had to do lighting. So it was a, a, a Broadway play on, on, in glass. And so Frank ran his shop from here, and one of his employees was William de Cooney. <laughs> So he lost telling me the story, and uh, he said, "When William, you know, when he got the show, he said that was it. He was gone. <laughs> uh, it was great to have him here. But Frank, I love Frank because he, he he had a family here, and he's had a long history. I think he I think he was 93 when he passed away, but I I hooked up. He and I hooked up, and we became buddies. So every day I would go to his shop and pick him up about four o'clock. We'd go across the street to Elysian Cafe, Elysian Fields." and we have a glass of red wine every day. That's Frank. <laughs> the voice of Frank. The voice of Frank. The feedback of Frank. And so we had a glass of wine every day, and in that cafe, we organized a uh, art show. He was in it, and I have a few other people in Hoboken who, who are still here, prominent artists. <clears throat> uh, Tim Hines, my, my other friend, J John Dean, is no longer uh, with us. He left Hoboken many years ago. 
but we had a great ride there and it was very well received. It was at the bar, back of the bar. And this is before it was renovated and became the Elysian. So this is today. 80s or? This was, yeah, 19, uh, I would say probably 83, 87, you know, uh -huh. there. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, that was a, a great experience. So, right. so Frank, Frank loved that. I said to Frank, so you're going to have to pose for me, Frank. I got to do a painting of you. Right. He was ready. Let's do it. A call. And that's that's featured in the show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll go to a couple slides sure. uh, and and, talk, and let give people a sneak preview of uh, some of the work in the exhibit, but also some of your past work. And uh, as we wait for that to happen, uh, uh, again, I think it's so interesting that you've been able to take your fine art experience from school, which was the department you studied in. But then the reality is to make a living at fine art is, you know, is a fluke almost. There's so you have That's to be right. an incredible marketeer, you have to be connected. You know, all the and you have, have to have to some the right place. money behind you because mm -hmm. it's not going to happen overnight. But you kind of realize that, hey, I got to make a living and you were able to translate those craft skills and art skills to sign business, and I would agree, your signs are a work of art. I think people are really excited, you know, when they see what you're working on there. And I, I always look, is the tagline Hoboken Sign Shop still? Or? Hoboken Sign. Hoboken Sign. Hoboken so, Sign, yeah. yeah. Okay, so up on the screen, we have, I'm going to say your master work. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's titled Hoboken Tempest. Uh, we moved this uh, the other day. Right. So we know the dimensions are 54 inches uh, wide or height. And uh, the length is just around 10 feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you come to see this in person, because digitally you don't get a sense of it really, right. Right. It's, it's really enthralling. Uh, oh, I was you. a little concerned it was too big for the space, but when we're sort of viewing in the upper gallery, we're in smaller numbers now because of the pandemic. So you get to sort of be close to this painting, one, two people probably max, and it really takes over. You know, it, it's like yeah, a 360. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. And you feel like you are on the edge of a roof That's or right. the cliff or looking That's into right. it but it's titled Hoboken Tempest. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could give the context for this painting and date yes. it. And so um, this painting came about, was all created in Hoboken in 1984, but it came about from all the resources and all the references I had pulled together while we lived in Jersey City on Ogden and Congress. And it's featured on the lower left of the painting. You see the roof, uh, that, that, building right there where the arrow is, that's the building. And I would work from the roof up there because it was such a dramatic cityscape, landscape environment. I was able to work at night in the day, beautiful skies, storms, lighting. Uh, you couldn't believe that what nature performed out there every single day. Every single day was quite different. Not to mention the living room, which was down below, was a five room apartment. The living room, you sit on a couch and that's what you see. Talk about a multi-million dollar sure, view, right? And as you can see on the upper left, there's smoke. That was Maxwell House Coffee in full operation, right, 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 right before the Empire State Building and there's the Chrysler Building. So I already knew the, the cityscape skyline because we did work in the, in the Chrysler uh, I knew the Empire State Building and also being able to work from that vantage point, I got to know the landscape really, really well. Uh, the World Trade Towers, I have several paintings and drawings of it going up. When we were going to high school, which is at the opposite end to the right side of that painting, we saw the towers going up. Sadly to say, we also saw the towers go down from the vantage point of Hoboken when we were here already from Pier A. That was a really sad day. So I got to see them go up and I got to see them go down. And it's a very mm, painful uh, memory, sure. but I'm glad I, I, I captured this tower. Uh, I didn't know that's what was gonna happen. And you notice we have a reflection on the tower. Those towers always had wonderful lighting 
because again, that environment, this environment that we live in, the northeastern part of this country, all kinds of drama happens here. This painting came about because I wanted to create, being in Hoboken, create a wonderful epic piece from my neighborhood. The people I've learned, uh, I've met, I've learned to love, uh, they became my friends, uh, my business, uh, and all the stories of Hoboken and the history that we have here, I decided I'm going to paint this epic. So I pulled all my references together. I got my drawings and I decided to make this work and you'll see other paintings, they're all done in the same way. This is a very old master technique on the, on the beginning of the painting. Uh, most artists, every artist including myself work on a canvas do the drawings and then you paint over it and your painting's done. I decided I knew that this needed something more, some more of a, of a gritty effect and I wanted to bring drama and I also love to draw. So the painting starts off with all my references and I built the city. I have three points of perspective and as I'm working my glazes and transparencies all in oil, uh, I also started to organize my weather pattern, the lighting for the weather and the drama of that. And I have three points of lighting and it works because nature can do that. You can have uh, a clouds overhead and you'll see a sunrise or you'll see an opening on the left where it's very dark, but the cloud opened up and it's reflecting everything on the right. Nature is beautiful in that way. So then as I finished my work and built up the glazes, then I would finish everything off with oil sticks. I have these very big, thick oil sticks. And I would rub the surface. Paintings also, you start off with a painting stretched on the canvas. Uh, this, all these paintings that are done in this style, this way, are flat against the wall. So I have to, I already know what my size is going to be, so I have to snap off what that's going to be. And you'll see some of the more complicated uh, pieces. Uh, that the, it's a construction and it's the way it's cut and the way it's hung on onto the stretcher. So then I work the surface up and because the, the surface is so, I don't want to say tedious, it's a wonderful experience and I listen to Philip Glass music when I'm doing the work because it's able to transcend me into a place where I can build my surface and make sure that I'm not overworking it or rubbing it too deep or and, and being able to bring the layers of of the tapestry, the tapestry effect. And that's what happens when it's finished at the end and it's lit very well. So it was wonderful to light it up here in the museum. And this is an intimate space. Uh, we lit it the way it was lit in the studio. So when it's lit in the studio, it's, it's, it has to work because of the transparencies and the glazes. It's like an old master painting. When it's lit properly, the light travels to the surface, floods the white canvas, and this is linen, by the way, not canvas. And then it, from behind, it lights up the transparencies and glazes, which creep through all the tapestry, all the nubs of the linen. Uh, and that's how this piece came about. Beautiful piece. You call it uh... Uh, Hoboken Tempest. Do you want to walk us through the title a little? Yeah, I've seen so many storms uh, and they were all beautiful. They were all that some of the skies were just green. It looked like something from a from a dramatic movie. Uh, it looked like the oceans, like you're out there in the ocean and everything is green and you can't tell the difference between the horizon and, 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 and the ocean. Sometimes it's all red. Sometimes it's all purple. And I wanted to be able to put all that together in one place. And so this is the tempest, uh, the tempest, the tension also of what we feel when we live and when we work in the tempest of nature. You speak about it very beautifully. Oh, and, you. Uh, uh, you know, I really hope people make the trip over to see it. Uh, just to be enveloped by this thing is pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely think of uh, music when I see it also. You know, not necessarily for me, Philip Glass, but just Ooh. just like, it's like a symphony. Mm. It's like not just 
one note or one sound. Right. It's a passage of music. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, very cinematic, very establishing shot, a uh, big picture yes. pulling back. That's right. And you, you do think of what was the natural landscape before all Before this building this. was done. That's right, you can and, see the Hudson River and, out there at uh, the edges. You, you, it's hard to imagine this as low plain area, meadows and yes. uh, flood zone. And you showed and, me those photographs right. of the 1906. It right. was incredibly beautiful and it was flooded with water. Right. Uh, and uh, there are buildings <laughs> now. There are buildings. Yeah, we do have pictures pretty much from the same vantage point because they came from the Conrad family who lived on Ogden Street. Oh my goodness. And they I were photographed I heard of him. almost this, you know, from this perspective, mm. from this vantage point. And they're wide. They're actually not as wide as this. We have two of them right. which together make right. them as wide. Right. Mm. And they're 1906. And it's sort of when they're first starting to develop the area in right. a serious mm. way. But mm. the town only goes back to we'll say Park Avenue or, you know, right. uh, Adams right. around there. And the Close rest the is season. open lot, kind, right. of, mm -hmm. kind of floody and meadowy. Also, one other thing I want to say is that being lit in here too was able to bring the presence of the darkness on the lower part of the canvas. And you see the light, Stevens Tech is out there. This, that's the setting sun from behind. Right, that's the that western kind of afterglow. Sun. Right, and then we have the lighting behind the skyline. It works. Sure. And then we have this shadow, the shadow cast from the Palisades because the sun is setting from behind and it's bringing the shadow up slowly. Right. So down at the bottom of the painting, you'll see the little lamps are on in some of the apartments while it's bright sun out there in the, in the distance. Gotcha. So again, come see this in person. I, in I person. see it as the event here in the upper gallery and the most impressive painting we've had for a long time. Thank you. So, Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I, I remember when you said you wanted to bring in extra lights and I'm going, oh no, you know, another mm -hmm. picky artist, mm -hmm. you know, no. And uh, <laughs> so, so, but you were so right, you know. As an artist I've in. learned, I've been in a lot of shows and some shows are lit really well. Right. And most of them have poor lighting. Sure. And I, well, I've learned my lesson early on, have my own lighting system with me. Uh, doesn't matter. I have my, my, my ladders, my equipment. And yep. We're able to set it up just like it was in the studio. And believe me, that makes a difference. Right. It was easy to do. You it made easy it easy. To see, so, right. on there. Okay. So up on the screen, we have a portrait of someone we were talking about before. Frank Mazio. And uh, to me, he looks like this ancient fellow. Right. You know? it, like this, I don't know, like I, some I Greek or Italian island. or Yeah, right, right. Well, you know, he was born in France. Oh, really? I yes. didn't know and that. And then he came to Hoboken and stayed. He's been here ever since. But the background was Italian or uh, not? Uh, French. French. It was French. It was French. Yeah. I mm -hmm. had no idea. Yes, en français. Yes. And uh, I loved drawing him. And again, this is where I'm saying that. My charcoal, my, my oil sticks, you can see the drawing effect. So I'm able to paint and draw and finish the drawing, finish, have that the drawing and the paint, the painting married together as one unified expression. So are you saying there's a sketch underneath this? There is. Okay. A full charcoal drawing. Right. Which I've learned from the old masters again. Uh, and it was it was when I was taking the night painting classes at SVA, I studied with a classical painter, Francis Chris. And we would have the figures pose and everything was done in charcoal. And the charcoal is what the old masters worked in, so that you can have your your highlights and your darks. So you have the contrast working up and working up your anatomy, skull, fingers, legs, lighting, all with just black charcoal. And then everything is fixed with a fixative. And then you start working your glazes on top of that. Transparencies okay. and opaque figures. And uh, and then I take it a few steps further. That's what you're, what you're seeing here. It's a beautiful portrait. I, I've met him a few times uh, oh, you know, yeah. of end yeah, of his years. Of and right. just from going into the store and right. trying to buy a triple zero brush mm -hmm. for something. And there weren't that many options for That's art supplies right. in Hoboken. Never was, in fact, right. I don't think 
Yeah, Hoboken never was never a good was. place. Never a good place for it was, art supply. It was hard to, we all went to compete with Pearl or, Pearl you know, whoever. Pearl or New York Central. Yeah, right. definitely. Mm-hmm. But you right. would go in there, and as you said, it was Day a framing shop. Mm-hmm. And recently, I uh, we received as a donation a painting of, of Mr. Mazio, and his uh, daughter was very, very proud of her father. Oh, the and, family loved him. Yeah, they were and proud of like, him. you know, he was the artist of Hoboken. He was the artist of Hoboken. And, and most I, people... And I, I, I approached him as that. Right. I respected him as that, and uh, I said, you're the man. You're... It, it's kind of interesting in a small town, like someone who was the artist of Hoboken, uh, you know, there aren't that many people who really knew know of him today that's true so your that's painting right. is carrying his spirit and i didn't i didn't know it was gonna we're gonna be here in the museum today talking about that's Frank right Maggio. yeah no right. it's kind of sweet it's kind of and you sweet. notice how big his hands are i was gonna say were they they were big they, they were big he hands. almost looks like a brick layer or you know right. someone mm-hmm. who really worked with his worked hands, with his hands. He right. worked with his hands sure cool okay we're gonna move on ah so this painting is in the exhibit also. It is. And it's in the uh, exhibit um, because as word got out, uh, <clears throat> a very wonderful person that I met in the sign business in the 80s, he was um, he knew of my work and uh, he saw this painting. And he, he's been collecting art for a while. Uh, and uh, he bought this painting for me in, I think it was 1983. I painted this in art school. This is in 1975. This is a picture of Jimmy, the ticket taker, at the Stanley Theater. And most people probably aren't going to know where the Stanley Theater, the Stanley where Theater it is today and is, how it serves as a function today. That's right. The Stanley Theater is a classic, beautiful Baroque theater from the 20s, 30s. Beautiful theater, in and out. And I was an usher there when I was going to SVA, and I met Jimmy. I had the same suit, except not a, I didn't look as good as he did. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy took his job very seriously. He, he, he looks serious. Oh, he looks like the consummate uh, ticket taker. Ticket taker. When I went downstairs to the locker rooms to change, Jimmy had two suits from the dry cleaner. He had white shirts that were pressed, and he had a cardboard panel hanging with three bow ties and a box of uh, batteries for the flashlights. He was prepared. Wow, and Nothing he'd been doing prepared. it for a while. He was doing it for as long as I remember. Right. So I was happy to, there's another person I met in my life and I said, I need to paint this person. Oh, that's cool. Um, and just explain to people where the theater was. The theater still is there in Jersey City in Journal Square. It is now the Jehovah Witness uh, building. They took it over and luckily they have the funding and they were able to do a lot of restoration there. Right. Uh, in this painting, you'll see the reflection of the stained glass to the right of his head. And you'll see the marble stairs on the left and the vending machine underneath the, uh, the stairs on the left. Right. And just as a sidebar, the Stanley Theater, if, uh, which is now the Jehovah Witnesses uh, House of Worship, you can actually go there and they will give you tours. Oh, really? And it you should go. It's amazing. And they give a, a guided tour, and which includes a little indoctrination, but not too heavy. Mm-hmm. And you, they still have the working uh, system for projecting the stars oh, on really? the ceiling. Oh, my goodness. And uh, yeah, like maybe don't go that. alone, mm-hmm. but you know, go with someone. <laughs> and it makes a great story, but wow. it's a great tour. <clears throat> Oh, I'm wow. not sure what's happening now with COVID, right, but right. Uh, that when you go there, there's like it's still the ticket office, and there's a little buzzer that says "ring buzzer for tours," right. and you can wow. you know, take it on. So I have to so. say, the, the owner of this painting, Mauro Minervini, uh, when he heard about this show happening, he reached out to me, and I said, "Oh my God, Mauro, I haven't heard from you in years," and he says, "I, I have this masterpiece that I've treasured in my life." And he sent me this picture. And I said, let's see if we can get it in, in the show, too. Oh, that's right, because we're actually seeing a scan his of his room. little setup. Because mm-hmm. I was going, where's the color? Where's the color? <laughs> the so right. talk about the technique on this painting, because it is painting, different. Yes, it's black and white, or appears black and white. I've learned not to use black paint or white paint. So I've been using other uh, 
phthalo blue, burnt umbers uh, to make the blackest blacks. And in order to soften up the blackness, I used orange. Huh. So orange, you notice there's a warm gray tone to everything. And I learned that in photography class when I took photography at SVA. Uh, and uh, being able to put your photographs on a warm background. <clears throat> and the way to do that with the painting is to add orange to it. I never knew that. You so. didn't know that? <laughs> oh, wow. No. There you go. That's what makes it so lively. His face is so friendly, so wonderful. Right. So real. But it's it's not airbrushed or anything? Nope. Or it's there's all... something so subtle about the tonality in his in his face. Well, that's the, yeah. the thing I was trying to capture um, with oil paint. Uh, and you can see his hands. I tried to get a little bit more painterly there because I like to get the knuckles and sure. the highlights on there. Right. Again, the anatomy and the anatomy right. on his face and the way the muscle structure. And if, if, if it was done in black and white, it would be a very stark, uh -huh. dreary paint. But because I used the orange. He's, he's so cool. He, he reminds me of the guy in American Gothic, you know, who's uh, yes. of the farmhouse. Right. Mm -hmm. This is kind of long face. This and, was in the pitchfork. Yeah, no, no pitchfork, <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, but it, and I love how he's standing behind the ticket uh, booth in a oh, sense, loved which it. they would have, you know, That's in right. older theaters mm -hmm. on there. Cool. Okay, we have some more work. We uh, we've been talking for about forty five minutes, really? so mm. we will we may have to. Yeah, you know, to cover the paintings, we may have to pep it up a little. But this exhibit, uh, I'm sorry, this painting is right behind us right in behind the middle. Us, right. Uh, generally in the upper gallery, we are pushing kind of a Hudson County, uh, Hoboken True. theme with the work. That's right. Uh, and, but this, you know, doesn't quite fit into that. Uh, but but we're so glad to show it. Mm. And is, is definitely here in the exhibit. And uh, this comes from... Different country, location. Yes, it comes from Pennsylvania, uh, where I have a house, and uh, I go traipsing through the woods with my friend Mike. He brings his camera, I bring my camera, sketch pad, watercolors, and it's amazing how many wonderful abandoned vehicles there are out there everywhere in the woods in America. And I love the thistle is my favorite plant, and I found short. So uh, not too far away from this tractor, a bunch of thistles were growing there. So I took the photograph of the thistles. I did my watercolors of them. And I realized, again, that the watercolors are not going to quite capture the intensity of the magenta. And the tractor, I love the mechanics of it. And, and it kind of it does represent our what this country was at one time, greatness, power. We still have some a way to go. We can come back to it. But I composed this for both images together, and I thought it was such a, a wonderful approach to have the thistle there with the tractor in the background. And that's painted the same way as the, uh, the Hoboken Tempest, charcoal, glazes, and, and the oil stick. And this is a great place to see the oil stick effect, the drawing. You also have it kind of a wrapped canvas? or I do, and this is part of the uh, process. Again, this is painted flat against the wall. And you'll see another painting here. We can skip to it later on, uh, where I used poplar, three-quarter round poplar instead of a square stretcher. I'll build a I build a, a, a stretcher out of three-quarter poplar so that it curves at the ends. For me, it makes it a softer ending than a, an abrupt square edge. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is where my conceptual part comes into play. The paintings that I have, that uh, we could probably skip to, there's a waterfall painting in there uh, where I have a three-quarter poplar and we have a hard edge. This is a painting I did. Uh, this is rounded corners. This is my wife, my late wife, Renata, and uh, she posed for me for this. We did this in about, uh, I would say, maybe a week or so. Uh, and uh, my son now owns this painting. He's uh -huh. got this. And my granddaughter now knows this is Grandma Renata. Right. Uh, this is the same technique. Or I, I don't like using the word technique, but the same orientation of materials. And it allows me to make that distance way up there at the top, far and soft and, 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 and lively. And then it gradually comes to the foreground. There's the pond. This is Box Pond in Pennsylvania. And then all the drawing on the foreground, all the, the, the bushes, that uh, uh, the fall effect, 
and uh, it's a it's a great it's a great piece to see in person. Yeah. Real contrast in color. I like how you've broken things down into layers. You know, foreground, middle ground, and background, mm -hmm. and just Thank a you. beautiful composition. Yeah, and, and that's again, you know, my, my uh, uh, influences: uh, the Hudson River School, uh, the great landscape painters. I, I mentioned Neil Welliver. I learned a little something from him. A little something from her. and this is I'm feeling it's a contribution to art history, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in my way of making sure that it's not just a landscape, uh, but it's it's a dramatic scene. It is. So this is, this oh, is, this is the one you were talking about, Columbus the, Park. I've, I hadn't seen this before. Columbus Park. This was done in 1984. If you notice the building in the background, the roof is wrecked. The park is flooded. The park benches are down below. In, in that, that's an actual walkway. And this was prior to Hoboken becoming the Hoboken we know today. That park is totally renovated, restored. It looks, it's a beautiful park today. Uh, in those days, it was a beautiful park then, but it's, it, was, it was very poorly cut. So this, was, this is, uh, in fairness, the Hoboken. This was the county park. So. The county park, <laughs> Columbus Park, right. And, uh, and this was after a storm, and it was flooded with water. Really? Yes. I mean, so that... I've never seen it like that. You've never seen it like that. And a friend of mine, I don't know if you remember, you, you must know Leo Serrano. Yes, sure. Right? He says, Ray, he came to the studio one day when I was working there. He says, do you know that that was actual a real pond back in the, when it was built? I says, no, I didn't know that. He says that it's actually filled up again like the pond. He says, right. You, you just it. need the goldfish. You just need the goldfish. Right. I had no idea. That's yeah. where the waterfall on that building used to fill up that area right right um so yeah columbus park was originally named hudson county park it gets changed to columbus park uh, i guess in the uh, mid to late 30s oh, when they do the statue mm -hmm. and the italian community is you know looking for recognition, recognition. of heritage and <clears throat> they choose columbus as right. their their guy so which obviously is going <clears throat> through some discussion yes. these days <clears throat> and the pavilion is uh, i forget the architect's name but all the hudson county parks are done by the same architect oh, so really? you could go to north bergen to braddock park yes. or lincoln, lincoln park, park pretty much see yes. the same pavilion right slightly different but with that Actually, roof i did not know that. and uh, luckily today um Columbus Park looks great. It looks great. I mean, they're and it's well used. A real testament really to the people it. who maintain it, mm -hmm. uh, the county workers. And the way it was built. Yeah, well, originally the, its infrastructure is still sure. pretty solid. And so you have the Palisades, and I'm forgetting the high rise in the, the background. Doric. The Doric, the mm -hmm. famous Doric, right? But it it does look like, you know. Not, I mean, it looks a little apocalyptic yes, in this does. picture. It like, sure was. And Columbus that, is that day was looking for the right path out and of that's this right. mess. And you can see the setting sun back there in the Palisades, and, it, right. and there's poor Columbus looking for <laughs> his ship. <laughs> He's looking for something. <laughs> <clears throat> he found it, though. Okay, cool. I'm really glad to see this painting. And that yeah. painting is about 58 inches. And where is that painting? That painting is in uh, my studio. It is? Yeah. Okay, cool. This is one of those, this is the Valkyrie Island. And this is a painting, uh, again, I keep saying again, because it's, it, I'm following a thread of my thinking. And so I'm very familiar with all the things that I'm pulling together here. Sure. If you notice the lighting on the upper left and on the right, there's a highlight of, of lighting there. That's a three quarter poplar. And then in the middle is one by two pine. So, I need I, what I wanted to do was create a sculptural effect of a painting where it wasn't three paintings butted together, but one fabricated piece to present the three images that I was seeing here. So, this again, here we go again, is uh, a landscape that exists and doesn't exist. Uh, the Trees in the background uh, are setting effect, setting sun that were there. And then I added the fog because I was at another location and I saw how the fog was working with, with the, when I finally put this thing together and I, and I did it in, in, in watercolors first and then crayons because I'm trying to get the effect of the, the, the oil stick. Uh, 
I realized this is going to be a very powerful piece. That sure. Kind of became the so you're saying you've married different atmospheres that happened at this location over a period of time. Uh, yes, that's right. Well, right. It, it happened in the location of my mind when I pictured it, completed. Right. So it was two different locations. Sure. I think uh, I think of the atmospheric feel you get in Turner's paintings and things like that. Another one yeah. of my, my, my teachers, right. <laughs> At SBA, At right? SBA, right. <laughs> SBA. <laughs> this painting, I consider this a, another epic piece, uh, a, a, a very, you know, a masterpiece, okay? This is totally creative from my imagination. And I knew when I, I, I also studied with um, Bob Blackburn, printmaking workshop in New York City. Uh, that was a great experience, lithography and etching. But the most important piece for me was studying Hanga woodblock printing. And he got me an instructor that I got to study with for a year, hmm. a Japanese master named Bill Payton. And I did a, a series of, of waterfalls, uh, again, based in, on the Japanese waterfall, right? Mm -hmm. The power of that, the moon, uh, nature, the sky is very important. So I decided I'm going to make this piece that was very moving because I was dealing with death. My uncle had passed away mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to make something that was awe-inspiring and terrifying at the same time. So this piece is Niagara Falls. It's the falls in Africa. It's it's all of that, and then you see the, the landscape, the horizon back there. It's a beautiful thin strip of land, and the trees on the left. There's little trees there at the very edge of the waterfall, and they represent us. And the waterfall, when you see it in person, especially lit like we have it lit here, it's so dynamic and electric. It's so powerful. Right. Uh, and you see, again, the rounded edges on the left and right. All right. So when you turn this around, it's a beautiful sculptural piece. Uh, a friend of mine in art school taught me how to build stretchers that are lightweight and strong with Japanese tools. And that fabric, which on this is canvas, is flat on the wall. And I knew that my stretcher was going to be like this. And I did a, a series of drawings. There was quite a lot of different iterations of what this thing was going to look like at the end. And that was the final piece and so the construction of that and then the canvas to be able to now make the cuts and fold them at the edges there where the three-quarter round and the hard edge meets so that's all part of the conceptual process and it's a wonderful i mean it's a beautiful piece when you see it in person right um i always think it's always interesting of waterfalls there's you know it's sort of romantic it's powerful and if you go to a place like niagara falls it's scary as hell. It's terrifying. I mean, you go, what's all this about? What you know, is this it's about? It's like you this feel nature. You feel this big. That's right. And you, you, it's, to me, it's dark. Dark. So terrifying. I do get a little darkness here. Yeah, that we're and, on the and, precipice. And rightly so. And, uh, That's right. And I would love to see it in person, oh, too. I will show it in person. Okay. And of course. Oh, baseball. Yankee Stadium. So, so you've kept the same format for some of these paintings. I didn't mean paintings. to on this. I didn't mean to on this, but when I finished my drawings again, as I said, I had iterations of the waterfall before, the arc of the stadium, mm -hmm. that's where it fell. Right. It didn't work on the left. It didn't work on the right. And the figures are it's such an abstract, wonderful feeling. Uh, you can see the brush marks, the paint marks, and you take this all in in different sections. If you're coming up close, Right. Several inches back and forth, uh, and then standing back and seeing the game, seeing the, the players. You know, at first I would go, why is he picking this, you know, sort of sideways crucifix form? Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. But it does work because how you've intersected it with the curves, you know, kind of Venn diagramish. Yeah. Right, and right. it's kind of fun. And you see it's that fun. little section of Yankee Stadium on the upper left of the square? Mm -hmm. That's where this, this is old Yankee Stadium and the subway would run through there. Okay. So a Yankee fan would know that, right? <laughs> right. right? Right. So okay, uh, wow. So this uh, and this I'm is a baseball fan. Uh, right. Baseball, any baseball is better than no baseball. Mm -hmm. So I watch all kinds of baseball. Gotcha. So we are at six o'clock, which is kind of what we told people our broadcast time. 
Uh, we've covered a lot of territory. I think it's been pretty interesting. No, I, great, thank I, you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, again, this is not in substitute to coming to see the exhibit. We do have a reception tomorrow. I'm spacing a little on the hours. I think it's two to five. Two to five. Okay, yeah. you'll be here two to five. Two to then, five, and there'll then, be social distancing. Yeah, social distancing mm -hmm. and wine. And uh, wine. Yes. Right. So uh, we hope to see you here. And cool. then it's a funny thing with COVID. Uh, one, of, not that there's a lot of positive things that have happened, but doing a program like this, we probably never would have done. Yeah. And right. now I yeah. think as hopefully we get back with the program of normal, uh, we will continue to do these programs because it gives a lot more depth. And of course they're archives. So, you know, people can look back on it and uh, check it out. And uh, it's a good way for them to get to know you. Yeah. Well, and, thank you again, as I said, the opportunity to be able to do this. Sure. You know, we don't get to do this often. You know, we do not don't get to talk yeah. much about their work. It's true. It's true. I mean, it's we're really always nice. in a rush. And, yeah, right. And, and, and uh, it's being able, it's nice to be able to, to do that. Slow down. Yeah. Slow down, slow and, down. And, and have a nice conversation about my work. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I also want to thank Grant Hoppe, who is downstairs. He's been our engineer yes, and Grant, couldn't have do, done it without him and uh, a lot of pressure on him. But uh, we feel we're we're getting better at each one of these, and, uh, and hopefully that's the case with today. And uh, see you in the museum, or as they used to say, see you on the avenue. Uh, see you on the you avenue. know, start start patronizing those Washington Street stores, that's keep right. the life going, mm -hmm. and then when you're when you've done that, come visit the museum at 1301 Washington Street. We have a lot of things going on. Yes. Thank you so much. See Thank you around. You everybody. Thank Can we you do for this?